Okay, so we're here and uh, Garwin Downey is chairperson, so I will yield the floor to him immediately. Okay, well, I'm delighted to be here today uh, to help Pat and Jude uh, launch this absolutely wonderful book. I, I just have to say at the, at the outset, there's so much to commend this book, uh, not least the fact that I have met and uh, admire so many of the participants. That's a copy of it there in all good bookshops from tomorrow, I hope. Uh, well, no, no price yet, gents, sir. That I oh, can I see a price. Ten pounds. Ten pounds. Ten pounds. Ten pounds. Really Twelve good. euros. Twelve euros. We try not to wear a class of person, uh, Gavin. We don't like to discuss money. We feel it's rather vulgar. But it is <laughs> ten pounds. <laughs> All right. Well, you paid for it. Well, okay. Uh, a, a man actually came in to my office 15 minutes ago, a farmer neighbour of Pat's called Philum Lynch, looking to buy a copy. And unfortunately, <laughs> I wasn't able to sell him it or indeed anything else. So... Uh, uh, I don't know if he's going to get back tomorrow uh, to the to the to the launch in the library, but if not, I will take a copy for him. Uh, anyway, I just want to take the hat my hat off to both you guys uh, for convening such uh, an interesting and eclectic group of interviewees. The last uh, entry in the book is Willie Malaz, a man I have known since I was a child, and but even so, I had no concept at all of the extent of his adventurous life, uh, from sleeping on the streets in Argentina. Uh, to becoming a top mechanic, to getting a PhD and lecturing at one of California's most prestigious universities. Uh, and I, I just thought it was wonderful the way that you did it, the idea of asking people what shaped them. It's very, very simple, yet it has led to some very profound conversations. The book, for me, has tapped into one of the, the real benefits of, of the COVID lockdown and that we've all had a lot more thinking time and some of the contributors clearly have given their answers a, a lot of thought. I'm going to ask you later on to discuss the actual process for putting it together. My own favourite chapter, I have to say, was the former education minister, Mary O'Rourke's, hands down. She came across as your favourite aunt. She was funny and she was irreverent and she was dedicated and very sympathetic. Uh, in her case, she was shaped by two very strong and committed parents uh, who unintentionally would give birth to a political dynasty. But I also love Frances Black, who used the experience of her, her, her tough early life at school and afterwards to set up the Rice Foundation and support the families of, of drug addicts. Uh, the writer and, and, and former IRA leader, Danny Morrison, we learned, was perhaps heading on an academic path, which I didn't know before his life was shaped uh, singularly by the pogroms in Belfast in, in 1969. Well, around that exact same time, curiously, Jim Sharkey's courageous wife, Sati, was telling him to take a chance and give up his secure teaching job uh, for a junior role in the Irish Civil Service. And Jim, of course, went on to great things as a diplomat and as an ambassador in Russia and Australia and, and, and Scandinavia. Daniel O'Donnell's story, equally very fascinating, uh, reminds us he was, he was in the road to become an accountant uh, before the lure of the spotlight and his sister's band took over, which again, just, just fascinated me. And the American politician, Bruce Morrison, could have been a chemist or a scientist. And instead, he went on and became one of the main champions of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, if he hadn't become an anti-war campaigner, anti-Vietnam campaigner in the 1960s and met up with uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton, who knows what would have happened. There are 20 in all of the stories, uh, which uh, one more intriguing than the next. I, I found Gregory Campbell. Uh, somewhat poignantly giving up a place in grammar school because his family, he felt, were from the wrong side of the tracks. And Charlie Bird getting tapped up for a job in RTE by Owen Harris while working in a Dublin bar. Uh, London Mayor Vincent Keaveney, who was in Derry this week, uh, becoming a barrister because his father's career as a surgeon was far too full on at seven days a week. And it's such a great insight in these people. There are moments in, in, in each of the stories when you suddenly think, my God, I knew, understand that person so much better. You identify them, whether it was Rushing Duffy struggling with Belfast and the austere and sectarian nature of it in the 1980s, something that I had myself when, when I worked there briefly, or the late uh, Professor Jim Dorland uh, uh, recalling advice that you have to turn your life around, you have a duty to pivot every 10 years. And, these are things that ring true to the reader, as, as, as you're saying, right, there's a real significance in this, and I suddenly, you're, you're getting the person. There's some very touching moments, too. Um, uh, Mary Madek's loneliness at, at, at boarding school after her father dies. Uh, Pat Coyle's obvious fear as the troubles descended 
right onto her doorstep there at Laburnum Terrace uh, and having to run through riots to the shop. Uh, you, you waited until the riots stopped. Um, so I, I, I suppose what you, what you do as a reader is, is you empathize with all these people and, and you can't help as well but think, what shaped me? Uh, like yourself, Jude, I still bear a few scars of St. Columns College, uh, which for all its successes, it was a brutal and Darwinian jungle. Though admittedly, my experience would have, been, would have been nowhere near as rough as it was for your generation and some of the contributors to the book. Uh, but on the positive side, what I would say is, is that the other author of this book, Pat McYard, he then became a real shaper or mentor to me as a young journalist in the late troubles and showed both by his advice and by example how to become a good editor and a fair and, and honest defender of the public interest. So there was so much in it for, for, for me as a journalist and as a person. So I, I, I would utterly commend this to other people as well. I'm delighted now to have a chance to talk to both of you about the book. I, I, I want to ask you both uh, first, and I'll put it to you, Pat. Uh, you've asked the question of all your contributors. Uh, so in a nutshell, Pat, then Jude, what is it that shaped you? Oh, that's a hell of a good question, Gavin. I think what shaped me more that, that I was useless at most other things. So the only thing I was anyway decent at was English. And I was always interested. My father was probably my father now, I think, to answer the question, honestly. For whatever sort of a man he was, he got up in the morning, he put on the news. Uh, he uh, he would go to work. He worked. He was a linesman in the ESB. And he would come back at dinner time and put on the news. And he would come home in the evening and he would put on the news. He bought the Irish press in the morning and the evening press in the evening. And on a Sunday, he bought three newspapers. And I remember I went to RT, uh, I worked in Larry Kenny and a paper called the, it was called the Dairy People then, but it's called the Donegal News now. But anyway, I went to RT and uh, there was sort of a training course for doing some editors. And anyway, I, the first day I was there, I actually wrote a news story and one of the chief subs says, have you worked here before? And I says, no, I haven't. He says, well, wait a minute, how do you know the style? I, the reason I knew the style, I, 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 almost by osmosis, I, my father had been, I'd been listening to it so long that it wasn't, you know, that was it. So that, that, that in a nutshell is where you started. What about you, Jude? You, you had a more peripatetic path, I think. Well, if you're asking what shaped me, I, I think every day shapes me with something. Um, I, I was very struck during doing the interviews at how much people were at the mercy of whatever occurred around them. And I suppose that if I was to pick out two uh, times in my life that were very significant, and I think shipped me for better or worse, one would be St. Columns, as you've sort of suggested, Garvin. Um, I was a boarder in St. Columns, and we used to envy the day boys like yourself <laughs> enormously. Uh, they to get home every evening and were at home at weekends. Uh, I really, f I, f I felt um, it was a lonely place, full of boys, but by God, you never got a moment to yourself, really. Uh, and in that sense, it was lonely. Uh, I remember it as a place of cold and a sort of an undercurrent of violence. And the most horrible thing about that violence was you sort of got sucked into it because eventually you became a senior and you could throw your weight around a bit. And you really had to check yourself to not become the bully you despised when you were young. So uh, I, the other thing about St. Columns is I failed not every exam like Charlie Bird, <laughs> but I failed an awful lot of them. Uh, I really, I, I don't know how, yeah, I'll give you an example, Irish, I never passed Irish once in an exam in five years in St. Columns. And I remember Father Flaherty predicting what marks people would get in our class just before the senior. And he went around the room and he said, McCann, you'll get a distinction and Dobbins, you'll get a credit and so on. And he came to me last and he says, Collins, you'll fail Irish in your senior certificate. And not only do I hope you, not only will you feel it, but I hope you feel it. And I hope you feel all your subjects because you're a lazy, and you went on for some time. And there in all that is, I got exactly 40% in the senior certificate and thus passed Irish for the first time in my life, uh, which was very significant because uh, that made it possible later for me to go to UCD, where I think, um, I had one of the happiest times of my life because I suddenly discovered that if you liked the subject you were working with and people weren't going to beat you up if you didn't do the right kind of essay or assignment, that you could actually enjoy the work. And it just gave me a sense of self-confidence that uh, I think I'm still writing on, you know. 
So, so those two, those two. Effect, yes, was an inspiration. <laughs> he, he, he forced you on. And, uh, was Who are you afraid to? To fly, Father Flaherty. Uh, I don't think so. You must have been delighted to go I and tell I don't him. think so. I don't think. But you know I think I've like many people who went through St. Columns, if they, if they had uh, any degree of success or happiness in their lives, it wasn't because of St. Columns, it was despite St. Columns, in my opinion. Uh, right. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's a very interesting answer from both of you. Uh, I, the second thing I want to talk about, you alluded to it slightly at, 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 the, uh, at the start was there, Jude. Is this, what, it's, what actually inspired this project, it's an unusual one to say the least. You, you, you mentioned uh, Studs Turkle in your introduction, mm. but you've taken it on a slightly different track. Well, yeah, well, Studs Turkle uh, had some sort of binding. Um, th this is this guy, academic. I think he was an academic, but he certainly was a broadcaster in the States. And he did um, two books I remember are uh, Working, and the other one was Hard Times. Working was talking to people about the work they did whole slew of people and then given their responses and then hard times I think was during the depression how they survived the depression so um the four books Garwin that I had done before using this format were all aimed at specific things one was in columns for example people always had left in columns in 1960 uh the second one was um oh yeah 1916 uh, and the centenary of 1916 and what it meant to unionists with the Battle of the Somme and what it meant to nationalists in terms of the Easter Rising. Then I had the Martin McGuinness book and then I had Bar uh, Brexit, um, the border and Brexit. All of those are a sort of political part from the first one. And I, I felt actually that most people's lives are broader than, than politics. Politics may well be an important part, but there's all sorts of little things or seem little things to us on the outside that maybe are very important to them and have and it might come from their family, it might come from their neighborhood, but it has many cases not a hell of a lot to do with, with politics. Uh, I, I don't know if you got that impression looking at the book yourself. So what, what what do you think, Pat? I, I, no, I think basically we sat down and we sort of said, what who do we think could uh Garvin used the word eclectic? And the one thing I th think deliberately we didn't want to do was just pick people from a certain genre and say right we'll, we'll pick them we just went for everybody and anybody on the basis they have a story to tell mm -hmm. and we like there's all sorts of groupings in there what we didn't want was to go down and like pick you know 10 or 12 sort of academics or 10 or 12 politicians we wanted to speak to people from a diverse background and diverse uh, uh careers and like you, you, Jim Sharkey, I, I always, I like, I was chatting to Jim, and I like the story he told. Like Jim tells a story that his, his grandfather was basically an uneducated fisherman, and that stayed with him all his life. That even when he was sitting in the halls of the great and the good, you know, the queens and the prime ministers and the emperors, and all, somewhere in the back he said, he said to himself. What am I doing here? I am Jimmy Sharkey from 74 or 75, Lecky Road in Derry. And it's, and, you know, and that is so true of so many of us. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, the, what is the golfer says, the, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. So many people, Charlie Bird, a uh, uh, story uh, is another one. He said, literally, he'd never pass an exam. And he says, see those fingernails. That's how I climbed up. And like, I think the stories in a way are inspirational because. You know, if you want to tell your children, look, wait a minute, hard work uh, can, um, you know, sticking at something can be as successful as being a genius. But it requires a bit of luck too, as we discovered. I mean, it's this theory as well. It's sort of if, you're, if your grandmother had not gone out and sat at the spinning wheel, she would never have met your yeah. grandfather. Uh, so that's, you... Dr. that's Dr. Collins's lane. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was struck by that again and again, Darwin. All, all the people, like, if you take Jimmy Sharky, for example, like Jimmy's an extremely able, bright guy, and clearly having progressed to be a bastard to God as of many countries, he has got talent. But it was the sheer luck, in a way, of his wife Sati noticing this advertisement for uh, a third secretary or something in the Department of External Affairs. It just was a chance of that that led him into the career he had, because he was just settling into a, a teaching career in Dublin in a school that he was very happy at. So, in part, you make your, the people in the book, same as ourselves, make their own decisions, but they're, they're surrounded by 
forces and currents that, you know, make them into a little cork bobbing in the waves rather than, I know, uh, following a line that they themselves have designed. Can I ask you about the methodology of actually producing the book? Did you actually do face-to-face uh, -face interviews, Zoom interviews? Did you send questions? How did it, how did it work out and how did, or was it a mix of everything? Well, Pat, do you want to talk about that? Uh, no, basically, uh, we sort of got in touch with people and said, look, uh, well, the way I did it, and I think Jude was very similar. We just said, look, we want to talk about your life. I uh, you know where you went to school, et cetera, et cetera. But then I, I became a stream of consciousness uh, in a way, Garvin, and was, that was much better. See, once people started to talk, it actually, uh, they lost themselves a lot of the time, and they just started telling their story. And in fact, half the time, you really didn't, or at least I found, I didn't have to really ask them a question. They started talking, and then suddenly, you know, and... And in fact, know what I found as well, Gervin. See, after about the second or third question, the people started to speak themselves. You didn't really need to ask them a question. They, you know, and I think some, on some occasions, it was pe people actually recognizing themselves things that they hadn't consciously been aware of. It's funny. I mean, the, the, there's this idea. Maya Angelou talks about the agony of having an untold story inside of you. In some cases, yeah. you actually, it seemed like you were opening gates for people. That's, that's true. Absolutely. I think. I I I we I, I don't know how Pat how worried Pat was, but I was a bit worried at first doing the interviews through Zoom. Uh, I, at that stage, most of us had got used to Zoom and seeing our faces on a screen, which would have horrified us a year or two earlier. But um, I, I thought that not being in the room with people to get them to do an interview about their lives, essentially, I thought that would be a drawback. Um, but actually. I thought Zoom worked really well. Uh, I, in fact, I wonder, was there a certain advantage in not being in the room? Did people feel safer being in their own house and you're not sort of invading them? You're just a, a person on a screen. But I, I, I was totally satisfied with Zoom as a medium for uh, eliciting answers. Would you agree, Pat, Matt? Absolutely. I'd say that the, uh, the days of expensive foreign travel by uh, senior executives are over <laughs> because you can certainly do, you know, the first class seat on Concord. Well, it's Concord's gone, but you know what I mean? I think the days of having, sending people around the world, I mean, Zoom, sorry, I agree with Jude. In fact, I, I think Jude's actually made a very good point there. I think half the time people thought, We're, you're not invading my space. I can sit in, my, in the comfort of my own home talking to you, but you're not threatening me or I don't feel your presence and I'm much more at ease talking to you in this way. Are there any stories that you got from these people that maybe, uh, they, 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 in retrospect, and Nicole later only said, maybe not, we'll, we'll, we'll not put that one in the book. As would often happen with an interview, you might get a wee call afterwards, they say, might have been talking about too freely there. Well, one, or two, one or two, but not, one, not one really. Wasn't that Mark? Was it Pat? No, I, I like. I, in fact, I'm not going to name the person. That'd be totally unfair. I thought one person was so honest that they would ring me up afterwards and say, "No, I look, pull that." Doesn't happen. In fact, I was actually quite surprised at how open. Uh, People were like, very. Oh, you know I, I think that's your point about the agony of the untold story. I think people. Of course, I find this generally when people do an interview with you about some aspect of their life. Or their experience in life, they, they they tend to enjoy it. You know, at the end they tend to say, "God, I, I enjoyed that," rather than, yeah. "Oh, that was an ordeal." Uh, I suppose uh, it depends on how you interview people. And I think I, I haven't seen Pat interviewing people, but I suspect he's a bit like myself. That rather than quiz people and try to pin them against the wall and show the contradictions in what they're saying, it just encourage them to talk and feel at ease to talk. Um, I think that feedback? works best. Sorry, sorry, to has there been any feedback since from any of the people that you interviewed about, about that? And just <laughs> well, well Roisin Duffy uh, contacted me and said, uh, I'm looking forward to the book, but I'm, I'm really worried because I can't remember a word that I said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the word, uh, you know, uh, somebody came out, used the word the other day, is cathartic. And I think that's a word, you know, I know when you tell your story and you say, maybe I've got a couple of things off my chest, things that maybe for years I haven't said out loud. I think in some of the stories, I think that might have been the case for, for well, I'm not saying it for everybody, but like for instance, Gregory Campbell, I, I, I know, I've know i known Gregory for a long time and I like Gregory, you know, we might have totally different, but Greg, I found Gregory very out and very open. And, and like he told, basically he said, I grew up in a place, uh, York Street, where he says, we had a 10 by 10 scullery and an outside toilet. 
And how was I supposed to be to blame from you know the nationalist community for them feeling discriminated against? Now that's a wee, in my opinion, and I don't mean to be patronising, a wee bit simplistic. There was more to it than that, but I got his point. Somebody else was asking us, Karen, about uh, was asking me anyway about what was the common thread, what was it that held all these together? And I, I, my first answer was that nothing held them together except that they're all human beings and got some story to tell. But when I look down, I see that in a way, they're, they're telling a personal story, say Murray O'Rourke's telling a personal story, but it's set within uh, a family, as you say, that were very political, uh, a sort of a dynasty that was established. If you take Brian Darcy, he's a priest, uh, he's a human being. He's, a, he's you know, he came from a small place in County Fermanagh, but his, his abuse, the, the sexual abuse that he suffered, was you know representative of so many other people who trusted in Catholic clergy. Uh, um, I suppose Charlie Bird is unique. Frances Black, you know, I, she's set within that whole thing of, uh, as you say, this charity, the Rise Foundation that she has established. But she's also set in the Black family, and. Mm. Uh, how she felt about things, how she experienced life was in part determined by that. She says, for example, and she's dead, right? Because I made the mistake. She says, people will often call her Mary. They, they could say, oh, I mean, Francis. They oh, tend to say her that? sister's, her more famous sister's name rather than that. And she says, you know, she used to find that hard to take, but she learned after what it didn't matter. Um, so, the fact that she was a member of a huge, um, well, of a family which came from Rathlin Island originally, where musicians brought that music down to Dublin, and you know the Black family are famous for their music. I think the fact that she was a member of that family uh, made her representative uh, in her story as well as personal. And the same applies to so many others, like Brian Brian McCabe is a, was a, a fairly high up cop in the Homicide Squad in uh, the New York uh, Department of Police. Uh, but he, he he deals with the notion of being an Irish American. What is an Irish American? How much it matters to him? And why it differs from being Irish or America? Uh, it's a singular so, identity. It's not an Irish identity. It's not American identity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, is that sort of public and and private sort of uh, one affects the other? One of the things that the, it's funny because you, you're talking about what unites it. I was looking at the different themes, and uh, one of the big ones that emerged was. The Catholic education system, north, south, and internationally, it looms large in the book. I, 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 and you yourself have alluded to your own experience there, Jude. If I was to ask you, Pat, if you were to poll your subjects, do you think that they would want the system, would they want it scrapped, would they want it reformed, or would they want it maintained? Well, uh, I would say the vast majority, at the very minimum, would want it reformed. I think a lot of them would want it scrapped. Myself and Jude have often talked about this, you know, the... There was a nastiness and a, uh, of the system that was so unbelievable. There, there was a sort of cruelty back in the day that, you know, that uh, I, I remember a teacher uh, strapping everybody in the class and stuff like that. I don't, the Catholic education system uh, was brutal. There's no doubt about that back in the day. Jude can back it up. Uh, everyone can back it up. It's, it's a fact of life. Um, in fact, a very simple, now this guy was in the book, but a friend of mine, I met him quite recently, and we're 50 years left St. Unans, and I met this guy, he's a professional guy, uh, and I said to him uh, one day, hey, are we having any 50th anniversary celebrations? And he turned around to me and he says, hey, Pat, what was there to celebrate? Well, Pat, Pat, I would agree with you largely. I mean, I would want, never stand up for, I, I was not happy in St. Columns most of, the great majority of the time, but if you look at Mary O'Rourke, she talks about her primary school um, education of the nuns as being really, she didn't like it at all. But she loved her secondary school education by another set of nuns. Right. Um, right. If you look at um, who Frances Black again, there was some of the teachers were really rough with her, and others that weren't. Um, I'm trying to think of um, uh, yeah, Mary Maddock, the poet. Uh, right. She talks about you know the tough time she has uh, at, at university, but then again at secondary school there was some teachers or one or two who made a great difference for her. So it's a kind of yeah. a mixed bag. And I would say the same thing, about, I should say the same thing about St. Columns. There were a lot of yeah. people who really shouldn't have been teaching, cer certainly, but there also were some inspirational teachers. Uh, yeah. And certainly I can think of one, uh, Sean Bill Kelly, who uh, shaped, helped uh, uh, 
helped me to love literature. I loved it already, but he intensified that love, I think. My I father, think Jim, Jim Kirby mentioned that as well. What's Sorry, that? Yeah, was, my father, every time he goes to his doctor, who is Shelby O'Kelly's son, Sorry. tells him what a wonderful teacher his father was. Uh, so it is, it is, it, it's funny it. that they do, they do stick with you. There's one or two in the generation that will stick out and you say yeah. that person was exceptional. For me, it would have been the likes of Sean McGinty, who would have been a great teacher as well. Uh, and uh, another theme, just, 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 just while we're on it, that, that is very kind of prevalent in the book is, is, is that of the conflict in Ireland. And it was a major shaping factor for so many of the, the participants, uh, even those not born in Ireland. Did that surprise you? Well, no, it didn't surprise me. I don't think anybody born on the island of Ireland uh, in recent times, Gerwin, can ignore it. Uh, just thinking back again to Gregory Campbell, Gregory said it wasn't school, it wasn't anything else but what shaped him by and, uh, totally was the political situation he, he said it totally dominated his life and that's why he ended up in politics uh, Jim Shargy would have told you the same that he would have possibly, he and his wife Sadie came back to Derry but uh, she couldn't stay, she had an asthma thing and the CS gas just after they, they made a big decision to come back into Derry and I think he was going to, I think he might have been teaching in Sturban and like the simple, the hard physical part of the troubles, not the psychology of them, the fact that there was CS gas and his wife couldn't breathe, that made the decision for them. And you can, uh, Gavin, you can go through right the rest of the people. Roisin Duffy tells the story about, and Pat Coyle tell the stories about the uh, what do you call it, not being able to uh, go out at night, worried about bombs and shooting. Like poor Roisin Duffy's sister was killed in, a, in one of these incidents. She was only seven. So everybody's story, the troubles. Even Bonnie Weir, who is an American academic, her first interest was, I think she met John Hume somewhere, and she got interested in the whole thing about conflict resolution in Ireland. And so even on far off America, here's a story where the conflict brings, draws people in. There's also a little, I just add this, Garen, there's a little twist to that, in that um, Pat Coyle at one point speaks about her diary she kept, and she says, reading back in it, She's amazed at how incidental uh, some of the entries are the troubles. She'll say, she'll talk about it, she'll describe what kind of clothes she's wearing. She'll talk about this guy she thinks fancies her. She'll talk about ordinary things that teenagers are absorbed with. And then there'll be a sort of a PS, you know, four soldiers shot dead yesterday. So uh, for, for many people who were fortunate enough, uh, the, the, the troubles were a background, a very violent background, and did, of course, shape their lives to some degree. But many of them managed to live amazingly ordinary lives beyond that. Shades of Derry Girl? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. The, the normality of the, 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 the yeah. art. The, oh, another issue that, that, that you didn't shy away from in the book, and it, it was refreshing to see it dealt with very you know, openly and discursively, was, was that of the, the issue of abortion. Uh, it was raised by a number of participants, including the late Professor Dornan and by David Quinn. Did it, uh, did, did it surprise you that they were willing to talk so, so freely and, and openly about it? Well, well I, I was chatting to... Uh, go ahead. Uh, no, you I, go I, on. I, no, go ahead. Head, go ahead. No, you no, make more I, sense I, than me. <laughs> That'll be a first. Uh, uh, Dor Jim Dornan, I, I thought he was very honest. He said those decisions should have been made in a consulting room, not on a TV screen. And I thought it was, a, you know, he said between the mother uh, and, and the doctors, he said, the, uh, he, he said, he took, he says, people taking moral stances on the issue uh, in sort of an abstract without knowing the, the, the conflict or the problems or the uh, outworkings of someone else's life. He said that he, 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 he totally disagreed with that. Yeah, um, David Quinn is a sort of an exceptional character because he said that uh, while his father had been the editor of this Evening Press, I think, uh, and Evening was pretty Herald, dis was. Hmm? Herald, was it? Evening Herald, I think. Yeah, uh, I think it was but Evening Herald. He, he was pretty disgusted by the end of his career because there was such pressure on him to increase sales at a time when it was hard. Incidentally, I'm keeping my eye on the clock, Garwin, to about another eight minutes. Um, he um, said that... Um, uh, when he came back, he went to Australia and lived there for six years, worked as a, uh, in insurance, I think, then came back and he said he got interested in journalism again and he got very interested in religion through the woman that he married. And he found when he came back that the Catholic 
church was in total crisis. And 99% of people, uh, the clergy, all the clergy virtually, weren't willing to stand up and uh, you know appear in the media. And he saw this as an opportunity for him because he had beliefs that were counter to the majority of people then. So he actually, uh, I would describe him as a right wing. I don't think he'd rejected it. There is a right wing Catholic. And uh, he, it was an opportunity for him to speak up and speak his mind. And I, I, now he didn't dwell on abortion particularly, but he did dwell on traditional beliefs about marriage and so on that were being kind of swept away in the tide of uh, liberalism that had hit Ireland uh, during the 80s and 90s. Um, so I think there was, um, not everybody was, well, I kind of, I'm trying to think that anybody else besides Jim Dornan and David Quinn mentioned abortion. Can you remember, Pat? No, I, I don't recall too many other people. Not but directly, it, was about, it was about the fact that Jim Dornan, I, I, I don't think I even asked him the question. I think he brought it up himself. Mm -hmm. But yeah, of course, when you're a gynecologist and an obstetrician, and he said, you know, uh, he said a lot of people had, when they had children with, you know, some sort of either a life limiting uh, conditions or uh, maybe another sort of learning difficulty or whatever. He said, it's all very well to have one child. But if you're scared of having a second child, how do you look after that child? You know, economically, what's the, the prospects? Socially, what's the prospect? How do you get them educated? Who stays at home to look after them? The child care. And he says, that was a big issue for a lot of people. But he says, that was glossed over by people with uh, you know, the religious morality argument. He said there was, what would you say, basically a lot of pragmatic and practical things that people were concerned about. It just wasn't a, just wasn't a moral issue issue for a lot of people. Uh, tell me, I mean, if you were to, to, to write the book maybe in 20 years time or, or alternatively, if you were to poll uh, 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 20 people from the generation below the ones that, that, that you would be writing it, do you think it would be a different book? I think it would because society what, would what? have changed, I think. Uh, what should, inevitably what it changes and that to some degree will shape people's lives. But as Pat has said, within that, there's a question of you, you get lucky uh, the harder you work. Um, so the, there is the personal input, regardless of the environment you're in or the society. But the society in another 20 years, I'm sure, will be very different from the one we're in now. I'm just wondering from that, what, what is going to be shaping the children of 20 years time or what is going to be shaping the, the, the social leaders of 20 years time or community leaders of, of 20 years well, time? Well, I, I think if you're talking about Ireland, at least in part, It'll be because I think there'll be a United Ireland of one form or another. And uh, for many people, for, if, I, if I was alive, I'll not be alive almost certainly 20 years, but if I were alive, I would feel that a great burden had been rolled off my shoulders if we had a United Ireland. And people were agreed that it was a good thing and were finding it something that they could tap into. It really would, I'd feel a, a, a border, a literal border, as well as a psychological border had been removed uh, and that everybody, you know, had just treated each other as human beings rather than as a, a belonging to a class or a tribe. Would you agree with that, Pat? Uh, Gavin, uh, funny, I was just thinking, me and my wife were having this question the other day. COVID's going to definitely shape this generation. Of, of that, there is no doubt. Like we were just talking, uh, my one of my grandkids, uh, my eldest son, she is nine. And she used to be out in the street with all her friends and all the rest. My other son has eldest uh, child, my grandson is three. He has not been able to go out in the street, meet people. He hasn't been into any other people's houses. He has no friends on the street. His life, he goes to his crash and comes back into his house and there's no communication. Now that's a massive change in the lifestyle. So I think that's going to change a lot. And I do think uh, to get back to Jude's one, Gavin, as you well know, the demographics have changed dramatically. And they, even yesterday, it's been disclosed that the, the protocol is actually proving very worthwhile for Northern Ireland, most growth ever. So, uh, and you can see the whole the whole world starting, uh, particularly in the, uh, by what the whole world, I mean, the Irish world, there are things that play now that in the next 20 years are going to play out. You know, add a note of caution, it'll be different. It'll be different in a different way from what we expect, because that's always the case. It's events, dear boy, events. Uh, dear, that's a very astute answer, all right. Come here, final question for you both. Uh, have you any plans to do another project together? Uh, this clearly has been very, very successful. 
Well, yeah, I would, I'd be interested, but I think Pat's is so sick of me by now that he probably wouldn't want to even think about it. But down the line, I am more than willing. We will, we will, if we can find a project, this one, I think Jude will agree with me totally. And by the way, this book was Jude's suggestion, and it was a very good one, very simply. Uh, we, were, uh, we were in the middle of COVID. I was restricted to five kilometres from our house. This project kept me going. I, on days like this, if you look out, anybody wants to look out my window here, just beside me, it is dull, it is grey, it is overcast, and it, the wind's blowing, and it's not a nice... Now, for many a day, I was sitting, retyping stuff, or, or talking to people. It was a great project to do for a, a long winter's day. Great. Jude, you would agree? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yes, that, that's true. It's always nice to have, I've always all my life wanted to work towards something. In fact, I've spent all my life, whether it's an exam or a job or something, always working towards something. Stops you thinking about really serious stuff, which I think is a good thing. Um, so but what's, uh, next, what's next for you, Jude? Then? I know Pat, Pat's going to finish his biography, which Colin Kilby Press are going to be publishing next year. Just a oh, reminder yeah. there, Pat. What, what will you be doing next? Well, maybe I'll do mine. Yeah. <laughs> story of a life. Why not? Why not? Everybody's a great yeah. story inside them. Yeah, one story. <laughs> Come here, that's your time out. So it's, uh, are we okay to do this tomorrow night again? Is that, is that, is that, that yes, sir. Yes. Tomorrow night. That'd be grand, that'd be good. Is that, are right. you happy enough with, with the questions? Are, yeah, are okay? yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yes. good. Yeah. This yeah. is a dry one, that's that. terrific. Anything we should add? Um, can't think really. If you said something strikes you, um, I, I, I'm about to let, let me know and we can we, we can sort of uh, we can chat about it. Um, we'll throw it into the mix. Okay. But that like time tomorrow night as well. Is that is that roughly? Yeah, we'll go. Yeah, for that's right. We'll see you tomorrow night, Garwin. Right, slant, slant, okay. Thanks, Thanks very much, Garwin. Bye, bye.